Ninja Jacuz here, RK3 Designs, and I have a guest today, Miss Emily Metzner. She is the wife of my very talented videographer and now has just come on board on our team as our production manager. So welcome to Emily. I'm so excited to have her on board. So I'm going to just grab her and um, just initiate her on her first day here and help have her help me do this uh, granite. So today we're gonna do a bagged granite. I know we've done some bagged granites before, but we're gonna add a few more little elements to this one. So we're gonna start off with just a regular HEB grocery store bag, whatever Walmart bag. But we wanna make sure, and check yours, we wanna make sure our, our logo is on the inside. Okay, because you don't want your paint to transpose or transfer onto your surface. Now, this is a two by four, no, two by eight sample board. Picture old rusty tin, all the browns, all the silvers and grays that are in that, that is the inspiration for this piece. So I'm starting off with leather gray spray paint. And what I'm gonna do is I'm just gonna fog my area first. And my board has been primed with bare paint and primer in one. Actually, it's called white. You could go any color that you want to, but I really wanted a white background uh, so I'd have a lot of contrast with this uh, colors that I'm putting down. So I'm just gonna kind of fog it very lightly. And all this is, is if you've ever looked at old rusty tin, you'll see little kind of spots of different colors. I just wanted it to be random. This is all gonna be in the background. All right, what I want you to do is I want you to do the same thing, shake that up. And I want you to do this. This is the aged metallic rust. So you're gonna come up nice and high and you're just gonna kind of keep your, yep. There you go, a little bit lower. There you go. All right, good job. All right, you're just gonna see from the side, you'll see it has a hue. It, there's no ma major patterns that we're trying to do. We're just trying to get some hues down on there. Okay, so you just keep that. I'm gonna keep this one. We're gonna take our bag and we're gonna crunch it up so that we have a pattern almost, okay. all right? Now, I will tell you that when I do this in a big um, area, when I'm doing a lot of countertops and a lot of spray paint, I do wear a mask, but we're gonna just be very careful and we're not gonna spray it all in the air. We're gonna do it right here so that we really keep our fumes down, but make sure that you are in a well-ventilated area when you're using your spray paints. All right, so what we wanna do, go off our board and you just wanna spray so that you have kind of just like that. And then we're just gonna very randomly push it down. There you go. And then just keep loading your, loading your bag. No rhyme to reason. Now what we do wanna do is when our bag starts to flatten out, we want to readjust our bag so that we have interest again. So you come over me and I'll come over you. Really address your edges. Now, see how you're kind of getting a big area? So what that's telling me that your bag's yeah, getting really bag flat. Okay. So readjust so that you have highs and lows okay. and just barely touch. Don't put your hand all the way down. Okay. That's how you, and, but it's no big deal because we're gonna go over all of these. Don't worry, don't worry about fixing it okay. because we're gonna go, we're gonna have so many colors. That's really all we're trying to do is lay down some really fun patterns. Now, I will tell you, if you're doing a whole kitchen, it's a good idea to start with the same color and do the same colors in that pattern. That way, all of your surfaces will come out similar. You're not going to get them exactly, but they'll come out very similar. Now, with real granite, a lot of times you'll have more areas of just white, more areas of maybe one darker color. So as you start, kind of in your mind, say, uh, you know, do I want one end to be more of a rusty end? Do I want to have another end to be more of the silvers? So kind of have that in your mind as you start your project and um, that'll dictate where you lay your colors down. So 
that's a good base. We can always come back and add more of these two colors. So let's grab another color. I'm not even gonna change my bag. Let's see, why don't you start with a dark taupe. You bring in that. I'm gonna bring in a little more of a contrast color. I'm gonna start with a dark walnut, which is a very dark color. So I'm gonna have a lot of contrast. So I'm kind of thinking I want to kind of make this have almost a pattern, like maybe a, a dark area running through. I don't wanna put it over the entire piece. We're good. <laughs> and this is a lot of fun. If you have kids um, or uh, someone that's never done anything creative, this was a really fun finish because you can really just have fun with this. Okay, so now I'm coming in with warm caramel, a very, very warm color. Uh, you see that color a lot in rusty tin. And Emily has, what color do you have, Emily? Kona. Kona. And again, I'm not putting this color all over everything. I'm just kind of strategically placing it. So let's start in our grays now. Okay. I'm gonna grab a dark gray, if you'll grab that smoke gray. Now you can kind of see as you keep layering these colors, how it's kind of coming alive. Now, if you ever, let me show you, I'm gonna do it on purpose. Let me say I put a piece here and I really just got too big of a blob there. Let that dry, then I'll come back over it with white and then you'll never know that you had too much uh, in one area. That's how you can also soften. If you step back and your eyes drawn to like one area, well, maybe there's just too much color, let it dry just a few minutes, come back with your white and then you can kind of almost erases it. Now I'm gonna come in and start filling in a little bit of that dead space uh, with additional color, because now I can be a little more creative with how I want my piece to look. I can come over that one spot where I had too much gray, hit it, and now I broke that gray up. And as your bag starts to get really sticky, it actually is easier because you can really manipulate it and move it around and then when you crunch it up again, you get some really neat visual effects. Okay, now I am gonna come over here because I still want a little bit of fogging and I wanna tone down that white. So I'm just kind of coming over the top and I'm high enough that even when you look at it, you're really not seeing a pattern of my spray paint because I'm high enough that I'm just taking away that really stark whiteness. All right, I'm really liking this. Okay, so now let's get the bling bling going on here. All right, now I'm just gonna add a tiny bit of our metallic because metallic will take over very, very quickly. And I'm just gonna kind of run it through. So it just kind of catches your eye. Now my eye keeps going to that spot that I did on purpose because I know I did it and it's bugging me. So I'm gonna come back over it with white because I am coming in with pure white, I do wanna to go to a clean piece of my plastic. I did not wanna see just that, that, clear, that big old dark spot. And even the white, because it's gonna be a different white than the background, will cause some contrast. When we pour our epoxy, we're gonna do some uh, finishes our techniques over the top of this. This is just the background, all right? So this is not gonna be what our eyes are drawn to immediately. Okay, so now here's the fun stuff. I love how granite has natural little cracks and fault lines, little veins. So the fastest, easiest, actually it's just fun, that's why I do it, is we use the Montana marble. And it's like silly string. Do you remember mm -hmm. silly string, being yes. a kid? All right, this is our inner child coming out. So it's Montana marble effects. This is black, and I wanna practice 
on my table first. All right, so I got kind of the spray pattern and I wanna do this very lightly, watch out. I do, I am wild with this. So as you do it, you just wanna randomly lay it over your piece. Now I'm gonna come back with my white and do the same thing. All right, what do you think? That is Isn't that pretty cool? Mm -hmm. All right, so we're gonna let this dry. Um, I would probably give it a couple hours to really dry well, and then we'll come back over the top with some epoxy. Okay, so during the break, I had this wild idea. I wanted to add a little bit of mica flakes. I do a lot with mica powder, but I need to really start incorporating my mica flakes because I love the look. My paint is still tacky, so what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna come in here. This is from uh, Stone Coat, the Southwest Desert Mica Flakes, and you'll see they're very small flakes, okay? I'm just gonna sprinkle them over, kind of almost in kind of a vein. And because my paint is still wet, I'm gonna tap them down. And I don't want this mica flake to be my main focus. I want it to be just something that catches your eye as you walk by. I don't want it to be the main focus of my piece. So I'm gonna come over here, do the same thing. Tap it down. All right, now I'm gonna come back with some reflective pearl mica powder. This also is from Stone Coat. And I'm going to be a little more random with this. These are little bigger flakes. So these are going to really catch your eye. And then once I put my epoxy down, I'm probably going to sprinkle a few more. We will let this sit a couple of hours and uh, we'll be back to pour a clear epoxy and do some additional techniques on the top. So we let the spray paint dry overnight and uh, I'm gonna finish this project, project up on my own. Emily had to go to work. So I'm gonna use 48 ounces of Stone Coat countertop epoxy, clear, haven't added anything to it. Pour this out. And I like to heat up my epoxy before I trial it. Two reasons. It's a little cool in here this morning and um, it just helps it kind of trial out a lot smoother. So I just barely hit it just to warm it up a bit. Now I'm gonna trial. One eighth by one eighth square notch trial. I'm gonna mix it up a little bit. Now, if y'all remember, I sprinkled some mica flakes on the surface of this last night and they should have been had adhered to the paint because the paint was still tacky, but I don't want to take my trial and scratch it. I want to be a little gentle just so that I don't pull those up. And if I do, it's really no big deal. I'm going to actually come in and add some more on top of that. Now I want to address those edges, push it over that edge. And because I'm short, <laughs> I'm not a hundred percent sure I'm going to be grabbing all these edges. I'll have to walk around to the front. Now, the reason I really like to use the trial as opposed to other ways of spreading, if it's a large area, it's because I know I can get the depth of the material uniform across the whole area. And the reason I like that is the next step that we're gonna be doing will look really good when you first do it. But if you have a lot of product on the surface, as time goes by, because epoxy levels out, you'll lose your pattern. 
So I wanna make sure that I don't have too much product on top, I have just enough. Chop brush. I'm gonna prime, since my brush is dry, I'm gonna prime it first before I go straight into the product so that the dry brush doesn't pull the product off. And I'm just gonna prime it with drips that I have. I know this is clean plastic. I know it's not been contaminated with any other colors. So I feel pretty confident that nothing's gonna be in there. So I prime my brush, I go in at a 45 degree angle, and as I chop, it's removing the trial marks for one. It's one more layer of insurance that I have that my product is mixed. And I'm bringing those air bubbles to the surface so I can torch them out. Okay, now, if I have a lot of product in my brush, I can always do this, squeeze it out. Take that, level it out. And I haven't wasted any product. Okay, so I've trialed and chopped. Now I'm gonna take out my bubbles. When I'm heating and I'm torching my bubbles out, I don't really torch my edges a lot. I don't like to put a lot of heat on my edges. It causes it to really run thin. But if I see some big bubbles, I will hit it and then maybe pick up a little bit more of the drips, readdress my edge and see how that goes. Okay, so now I've got a nice, beautiful level finish. Bubbles are popped. Now I wanna come in with some mica flakes. I've got three colors here. I've got a bronze mica flake from Stone Coat. I have a reflective pearl mica and a silver mica. Now the reflective pearl micas are really big. They're really big flakes. I think they're gonna really give some cool uh, looks. But I'm gonna start with my bronze. I don't want them all over. I want them in areas like natural stone. A lot of times natural stone will have little flakes ever so often. You don't see them completely over the entire piece. So I'm gonna kind of bring these in and strategically kind of place them almost in like a vein. Yeah, I kind of like that. If you go from really high, you can kind of let those just kind of flow where they will. All right, now I'm gonna come in with my bigger flakes. This is the reflective pearl. So I'm gonna be real strategic with these and be a little more random. And I know that the camera is not gonna pick this up because I really have to move around and let the light hit it just right for me to be able to see it. And that's exactly the look I'm going for. I don't want these flakes to be the first thing that you see when you walk into the kitchen. I want them to be interest, kind of like piggy boos. Now you kind of step back, evaluate your piece, and see if you have like clumps of the mica powders anywhere that, I mean the flakes maybe that you want to push down. Right here I've got a couple of clumps. So I'm just going to take my fingers and I'm just going to kind of work that down in. Get those mica flakes to go down into the epoxy and also sometimes they turn a little bit and they're gonna catch the light a little bit different. Now the next technique I'm gonna do, I'm gonna fracture this so it looks like granite, but I like to let my epoxy set 10, 15, even sometimes up to 30 minutes because I want it to start to get a little heavy, a little gelled so that when I do the next technique, my, uh, finish my uh, pattern doesn't really move a lot. I want it to kind of stay. So I'm gonna give this about 10, 15 minutes to sit and then we'll go on to the next step. Okay, so I really don't like to waste material and I'm always adding things to the top of the finish. So I'm gonna scoop up my drips, put them in a cup now, I would only do this if I knew that the plastic that's underneath here wasn't contaminated with other colors that maybe I didn't want in the top finish or dirt or any debris like that. And I'm gonna add just a little bit of the Alumilite Brown Opaque Dye. This is a gorgeous color. And I mean, when I say a little bit, 
one drop. That's all I'm adding to this amount of epoxy. Oh my gosh, that looks like a really thick, strong cup of coffee. All right, so I'm gonna use that here in just a little bit. Okay, so we're back. I've let this sit for just a little bit, and now we're gonna do the next technique, which is a granite effect, where we use spray paint and mica powder mixed with 91% alcohol. I'm using deep silver metallic and brown metallic. Have these setting by because this is gonna be a pretty fast uh, technique. You don't want the spray paint sitting on top of your piece for very long because what happens that spray paint starts to dry or it starts to sink and you don't get the fracture. So I like to do this in sections um, because if I were to spray the whole piece at one time, then by the time I got down to the end, that's gonna have a different effect because my paint's starting to dry. If I have two people, a lot of times what I'll have someone do is they'll come in with the spray paints, I'll come behind them with the alcohol, and that way it stays uh, cohesive through the whole pour of the kitchen. All right, so we're gonna start off, the main color I'm gonna use is black. I'm gonna do heavy in some spots, very light in other spots, I'm gonna hit a little bit of dark walnut in some spots, so it's gonna be very random. All right, here we go. Get my alcohol, and I have my alcohol where it's dropping big drops. You can also put it in your hand and you can drop it. I really like to do it like that also because you get a little more control. All right, now I'm gonna come in with my silver and I'm just gonna kind of hit in random areas. Now let's say I have a spot right here where I really don't like the amount of silver that I sprayed, it kind of overpowered it. So I'm gonna get some clear or plain and I'm gonna drip that plain right there and it's gonna break up that massive amount of mica powder. I don't want my eye going to that. I like to start, if it's really big, I'll start and I'll kind of come together because right now I may have alcohol right here on this area. And if I go over the top of it with spray paint, now it's gonna give me a little bit different type of pattern. So I'm gonna kind of come down here and work so that this uh, alcohol has a little bit of time to evaporate. And I'm gonna come in, hit my edge. And you'll notice I'm doing the same pattern, the same thing that I did there. I'm not changing anything up. All right, perfect. All right, moving fast. I'm gonna come a little farther down the line here. All right, now I'm gonna come back to my first area. I'm gonna spray a little bit here. And I'm not gonna make this quite so dark. I want it to be a little less dominant. Oh yes, I like. All right, same thing here. All right, I really like this. There's a couple of uh, big spots that I wanna break up a little bit, but because I already have quite a bit of mica powder on the surface, I'm gonna come in with just my uh, clear alcohol, kind of break up some of these really dark areas. Don't judge it at this point. You need to let the pattern develop. I am barely squeezing. If you can see, I'm not even squeezing the can, the, the squirter all the way, squirter, is that even a word? The handle all the way back. I'm just barely pumping it. There we go. All right, I love this. Awesome, okay, I'm gonna let it sit. I'm not gonna mess with it anymore. I'll come back in about, oh, I don't know, 10, 15 minutes or so, and we'll see where it's at. Okay, so we've let this sit. 
15 minutes maybe, 20 minutes. And now I'm gonna come back and I'm gonna add some very, very tiny veins knowing that these veins are gonna move and spread and lighten out and become a little more transparent over the curing time because my epoxy is gonna to continue to move. And I'm not doing a whole lot, but if you'll notice, most granite has some sort of fault line. And if you can see, it is very, 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 very tiny and it will expand it will spread out over time. And if you'll notice how I'm really moving it, I like that it's a little thicker, have a little bit more control. Load up my brush, start off my piece, and start running around. And you want it very organic. To me, fault lines take your design to the next level because it makes it look so real. Now I love the next step. The Montana marble effects, which is what we put down already when the piece, uh, when we were just doing the dry work before we had the epoxy. Now we're gonna put it on the surface. You're gonna get a different look with this, however. Because the epoxy is going to continue to move, your lines, your design, it will cause the long strands of the Montana marble to eventually break and pull apart. So you're not gonna have continuous long streams like you do when you put it down dry, but it does really give a neat effect. Now, what you do need to realize also, every so often this will leave a little bit of texture on the top. So when this cures and you get ready to pour your flood coat, I always hit it very lightly with some sandpaper and knock down any of those highs. Uh, but I really like the effect that it gives this just gives it more of an in-depth 3D look. So shake it up really well. I want to see my pattern first on the table, make sure it's not clogged and I'm getting the pattern I want. And then I'm just gonna come over the top of my wet area. Okay, now I'm gonna do the same thing with the white. Now I'm gonna caution you on your white. White can take over very quickly. So have in your mind the look you're going for, I don't want to do it over the entire piece, just kind of almost like my fault lines. I want it to be just in certain areas. Again, I'm going to check my, my spray pattern, see which way it's spraying. And I'm just going to decide little areas that I want it in. Now look at that. That is cool as heck. I really like that look. All right, so I'm not going to put it over the entire piece. There, I'm done. Love it, love it. Hit, I'm gonna hit an edge. Ooh, I like that. Okay, so I'm gonna come to the front and I'm gonna hit edge. Awesome. Perfect. I love this. Very recreatable finish. I did a whole kitchen and three bathrooms with the exact same technique and they all look so cohesive they look great, they're all different. However, when you put them all together, they look so much alike. Like I said, this is very recreatable and it is a great sellable finish. So I hope you like this video. Give me a thumbs up, subscribe to our channel and hit the bell so that you'll get future notifications when we post uh, different videos. Don't be scared, move forward, and be creative.